I'm Connor Hagen. I'm graduating with my bachelor's degree in creative writing with a concentration in fiction. And this is an excerpt from my novel, The Siren Song. Jay didn't know where they were going at first, just that they had to get away from their aunt's house and away from where the memories lived. Aaron used to be good to them, they thought bitterly, except he never was, because a 21-year-old should never have been dating a 17-year-old. Jay had been drawn in by their mystique. The eyes so light, they seemed like clear water, a bay that Jake had launched themselves into. Aaron's smile tasted sweet like a pastry chef sampling too many creations. God, that Jay had ever kissed him. Aaron had been good until he wasn't. Soft love and an arm around Jay's waist. Little Jay had stopped putting up with the bullshit on the other end. But Aaron's message was clear, and he had said as much. Stop pretending to be something you're not. This is right before he dug a fist into Jay's side. The words now echoed over and over in Jay's head. But how could they do that when Aaron had stripped them of any sense of knowing? How could they possibly be anything other than lost? It was April in Shelburne County. Jay was almost the age Aaron had been when they were together. Jay had yet to hit someone who trusted them completely. That didn't matter to Jay's not Brianne, who had introduced the two. He thought they could talk about all that indie music stuff. No one loved Jay, not really. The people who thought Jay thought did had only pretended to get what they all wanted. Their body had already decided what the best course of action was before their brain had. They turned out to draw a throat. They walked despite the fog in their head, despite the dreamy quick pace of their feet. Jay was light, airy, empty. Remembering a promise to Cobias and Corey, they posted the signal words and threw a closing statement online, even though it would probably make no difference. No one would want to rescue what Aaron had referred to as a homebrewed freak. It was true. Not even their family loved them, picking apart Jay's every action until the eventual day they were outed and moved in with Aaron. They would never be considered beautiful again. Jay would never be anything more than Aaron's physical and verbal punching bag. Whoever they were supposed to be was buried in some deep, dark labyrinth inside of them, something they could never fully navigate. All they were now was someone who belonged at the bottom of a river. Hi, my name is Delia Rainey. I am getting an MFA in creative writing, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a nonfiction essay called The Flower Woman, which is featured in my nonfiction thesis called Remembering is My Only Task. In unpacking my library, Walter Benjamin said, every passion borders on the chaotic but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. Who collects my memories when I'm dead? They don't just drag out of me all at once, like excrement or the last breath to be folded and gathered away. I think it's my responsibility to leave them behind in a coherent trail. It's my responsibility to communicate. Is it someone's responsibility to ask? And what if the trail of memories gets too scattered, unreadable? Even in the writing about my life and the lives of my loved ones, there is no fixing the inevitability of blurriness, the coming and goings of exterior and interior parts of us. When my dad was in the hospital, I couldn't cry there. I didn't want to be dramatic. Instead, I slept on the waiting room chairs since I hadn't slept the night before. And this external image of a girl sleeping folded into herself in a hospital equates a similar emotion in me as a crying girl's image. Sometimes I imagine myself crying in front of people I love, like practice, because it is so difficult for me to do so. I taught myself to never cry in front of them, to never make them more sad, but maybe my tears would make them feel good. Solidarity of the interior world.
A decade after first opening The Flower Woman in my parents' dining room in St. Louis, I would unfold the scanned page my Uncle Norman mailed to me of the original 1946 newspaper article on my dining room table in Chicago. I knew I'd read the words of the article before, transcribed in my Uncle Norman's book as the first chapter, chapter one, Bela Yidda, The Flower Woman. But in the vintage newspaper format, fitted into skinny journalistic columns, the words read differently. Rhythmically, the article is broken up with line breaks, organized in long bars of words. The breaks happen simply because of the limits of the document. Columns filled with little black letters looked like scrolls. I read the article lyrically like a poem. Thank you. Hello, my name is Itohan Osaikbovo and I will be reading two poems. Daybreak writes in Abed for the convict. Morning shine. Morning, shine, a shrewd light. Tell his cousins it's visit time. Gather ash from the dirt of the abandoned basketball court. Make sackcloth of outdated jerseys. Trade whales for commentary. Let his hood speak of the inhumanity of cages, of muted flesh, of the penitentiary, the sun today wants to sing. The sun wants to sing of the free boy swinging from a sheet in his cell by himself. Note his release. For black women from their daughters. For black women who wait for the air's like kindness for fields we are unheavied, for exhales of ease the color purple, for black women dancing with mountain toe secrets in fiery fields and Sunday pews, for black women dreaming of kings in Statesville, sharing sorrows thick as banana pudding and that girl who loves him, for black women moving out of state to escape the corner, where discoloration carries the memory of blood covered sobs from pavement to stairs for black women tired of watching the porch for black women who were girls given a woman's role only to turn a woman and still not be their own for black women who know no other way to be a black woman or make one we understand the bitter mix will spread thin, cook up different. It will taste like butter cake. It will inform our sympathy and sameness. All us black women who never wanted the kitchen crown, but perfect every recipe we know. Watch the flavor rush its way into the batter. We will make it better and weep with a stone face stirring. Thank you. My name is Juliana Ravelli de Oliveira. We all agree that the place where Dad was born has the most beautiful starry sky we have ever seen. Sometimes Marcelo and I would jump with arms raised trying to catch the stars that seemed to be so close to our heads. They had different colors and seemed to be in a constant, massive, ancient movement. We would all sit together in those wooden stools to cherish that beauty and count how many shooting stars we were able to see. I remember that saying, Mais uma, mais uma. 
another one, another one. At that time, Grandpa Cirilo, Grandma Belmira, and Uncle Cesario were still among us. There was no electricity on the farm. The woods about 50 feet from us were pitch dark, but I don't remember ever being afraid. Inside the house, we had kerosene lamps, but we didn't need them outside. We had the stars. Like me, Marcel is crazy about space, the universe, astronauts, and spaceships. I wonder if he was affected by the sky of Minas Gerais. That time seemed so magical that every once in a while I ask mom about it to make sure it was real and not a dream. Sometimes I wish we could go back in time to watch those stars again together with my wild child spirit. I don't know where that child went. As an adult, every time I looked at the crux, I felt love because it reminded me of you all and those moments of simple happiness. I make an effort to remember the difficulties we had to overcome together. I know that back then they seemed huge, but they, they are so small right now, like the stars that are actually huge but they seem tiny because they are so far away. I wonder if today's hardship will become tiny in the future too. Probably, right? It is raining in Chicago now. I wish that the sky would be clear tonight so I could look for the crux. I'm not sure who taught me that, but mom or dad told me that if I got lost someday, I only needed to look for the crux and see that the longest line formed from Rubija to the Estrela de Magalhães point south. But then I remember, I'm not in the south anymore. I'm in the north. Here beyond the equator, I cannot see your constellation. I read that in 12,000 years, people in North America will be able to see the crux. But by then, I will not be, be here, neither will you. Hi, my name is Nia Tipton, and I'm receiving a Bachelor's of Arts degree um, in Creative Writing with a concentration in Fiction, and the genre of my reading today is Fiction and the title of my piece is For the Damned, and it's just an excerpt from the first chapter. One, two, he's coming for you, she murmurs, hair falling into her face as she rocks back and forth. Three, four, lock your door. Her voice is lower than a whisper. It's a sigh leaving her mouth and taking form. Her hands cover her ears as the snapping twigs get closer. Come on, sweetheart, he says, and he sounds heartbroken. Why are you hiding from me? She needs to run. She has the keys in her pocket and she needs to run away. She needs to run to the car, hop in, and drive to the nearest police station. She needs to let them know that she's alive. She wonders if they're even looking anymore. She's been gone for so long. Too long, probably. A year and a half is a long time. He walks away from the shrub she's crouching behind. Her eyes dart to the side, where the truck is parked. She swallows. Her eyes return to him watching as he walks towards a line of bare trees. He's tall, not too old. She'd probably find him attractive if he wasn't a monster. He starts to whistle, and the sound brings back memories she doesn't want to relive. Her eyes shut, her hands go to cover her ears, and she starts singing the song again. Five, six, grab a crucifix. Make it stop, she thinks, as the whistling gets louder, louder, louder. Make it all stop. She's running a few seconds later. He hears her, but he's too far away to catch her in time. She gets to the truck quickly, even with a hurt and bleeding foot, and then she's starting the engine and locking the doors. He reaches her just as she throws it into drive. Cole, he yells, and she can't help but look at him. She doesn't even see him as human. He's wild eyes and sharp teeth and curved claws, a monster to the bone. He's pounding on the window and screaming. Spit is leaving his mouth, and she can't help but sit and stare at him. 
eyes wide, mouth agape. You can run, but you can't hide from me, Cole, he screams, banging on the window so hard that she's afraid the glass might break. She can't move, though. She can only sit in the driver's seat, one hand on the steering wheel, her foot on the brake. She's not moving. She's stagnant. She doesn't know why she's not moving. She just stares at him, and then he pulls the gun out. Her foot slams on the gas pedal as a shot rings through the air. It shatters the window pane, but misses her, lodging itself in the roof of the truck. Tears are making it hard for her to see, but she pulls a sharp right at where the driver reaches the road. Her eyes settle on the mailbox for two seconds, and she only sees two numbers, one and seven, before she's passed by it. Her foot pushes down the pedal more as she registers the sound of a starting car behind her. Come on, she cries, tears spilling down her face, hands hitting the steering wheel, as if that will allow the truck to move faster. She doesn't know she didn't know how to move before when she was staring at him, but all she wants now is to move faster. The truck speedometer says she's going seventy miles an hour, but still isn't fast enough. The dial inches up to seventy five, then eighty, still not fast enough. She merges onto a state road with a clenched jaw, cringing when the tires squeal and the car tilts in protest of her speed. The highway has a few more cars on it, and she debates trying to contact one of them. She doesn't know how she'd do it though, and she doesn't have any spare time to ponder it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nina Moldowski. Uh, I'm graduating with a degree in creative writing fiction, and this is an excerpt from my thesis novel, Cupcakes for Supervillains. I was seven years old the first time I did something horrible. We were on a snorkel tour boat in Hawaii, which seemed to be more floating bar with a pretty view than expedition in marine sports. My legs were tucked on the white plastic cushions, and I leaned anxiously against the railing, watching a rocky coast drift by. Bethany, look! I pointed across the waves with my wiry little arm. A house? Yet, yeah, she smiled, and the sun glinted in her pearly teeth. A few curls flitted in her face, all wispy and dry, while the rest of her hair dripped in a sopping wet bun atop her head. I grinned because she was grinning, and she looked all angelic in the silky, faded blouse tied at her waist, even while it puffed out like pillows in the wind. Who do you think lives there, Cherry? Bethany nodded out the house, which was a two-story tower of modern architecture, all slants and angles and windows big as movie screens. People live in Hawaii? My eyes grew wide. She laughed. Of course they do. I turned to the house and tried to imagine its resident. I pictured a woman with short orange hair and boots as tall as her knees. She'd hang big maps on the walls and stand wide with her hands on her hips and the confidence of an aviator. The sun would set out her movie screen windows and she'd squint as the horizon simmered, a little smirk on her lips saying, I'll conquer you tomorrow. On reflection, she might have been Amelia Earhart. I was really into Amelia Earhart. I looked back to Beth, bubbling to tell her about my imaginary woman, but she was staring down at her old flip phone with a gentle smile. What's on your phone? I asked. Nothing, she blushed, which meant Walker was on her phone. He'd been on her phone all vacation, so she kept staring at it, missing the sunsets and the dolphins and the palm trees. I'd say, Beth, and she'd say, what? And I'd say, look, and she'd say, hold on. Then my little fingers would slip off her thumb and she'd raise it to text. Her phone blinked and she shook her head, giggling softly under her breath. I can't believe I have signal. Beth was 16. She'd never had a boyfriend before. Not that I'd noticed. I looked out over the railing, but the house was gone. Then, maybe shadows and the peaks of waves suddenly looked a bit like shark fins. Maybe the smells filled my nostrils and I was overcome by the stinging scent of fishy sea salt and bitter rotting fruit. Gross, I thought. Something's rotting. Though, now I realize it was probably just the aroma of sloshing booze. I dove into her, and what was meant as a hug had the force of a tackle. She flew back against the cushions, and I expected her to laugh, but instead she yelled, Cherry! and scrambled out from under me. When I saw her hands, bare and free, desperately pat the seats and grip, grip, grip the railing, mine began to tremble. She stared down at the waves, slapping the side of the boat, and when her eyes dropped, my heart broke. Her phone was gone, and it was my fault. It wasn't long before mom and dad jogged into the mix. 
I remember the look they gave, that flicker of horror that I might have purposefully sent Beth's phone overboard. To be honest, I don't know if it was on purpose. The moment it happened is fuzzy. Everyone argued, and I stared as the floor wobbled like the waves beneath it, and I wished I could slip under the surface and let the water clog up my ears, sink softly to the sand floor, and comb for shells with my fingers. All the voices yelling became faint and muffled, warbles of sound. I thought, it's the orcas telling each other lies. But I couldn't sink away from the shame. It haunted me for the rest of the boat ride, the vacation, the year, my life. Sometimes it would bubble up out of nowhere, popping around the corners like a cheesy jump scare. I'd be 12, playing my first tennis match, and I'd squint past the sun, see Bethany che cheering in the stands, suddenly, bam, five years of guilt, and I'd miss the serve. But sending my sister's phone overboard a booze cruise is a molehill compared to the mountain I've been climbing now. Hi, I'm Nisha Bolsi. Um, I'm in the poetry program and I'm going to read a few poems. First one is called Leavings. When the rivers run black, we learn to bathe in the rain again. It tastes like the salt left over when memory recedes. At the end of the street, another tree becomes ash. Come night, we will rise to scatter the remains onto the sand because the waters couldn't hold anymore. This is an elegy for what couldn't be undone. A sky that sags heavy, hand over our mouths that forced us to breathe with eyes, fingertips, every part we have left. When we finally learned how to survive, we didn't forget how to destroy. On our backs, we carry them, all of them a planet of beings already cleaved from this star. Next poem is called Eating Animals. The neighbor's dog eats chickens whole out in the courtyard, sometimes even a slab of beef, beef, a word that means cow for eating. I have to buy things for M to bite so she won't think so much about meat. I used to believe that chickens, animal, were different from chicken, food, a word with unrelated meanings like bark or bat or desert. Once I saw a chicken accidentally step on one of her eggs and scream, the skinny red foot dripping in runny yolk. She smelled death. M is most relaxed when chewing or ripping something apart. We live together in a building on an avenue in a city humans built. I take her to the corner and around the block. I show her where to sleep. I open and shut doors to keep her in or out. At night, she settles on each corner of the bed, resting on my legs, on my chest, at my feet. You're her whole world, someone said to me when I first brought her home. I grimaced swallowed hard to get the taste of it out of my mouth. Thank you. Hello, I'm Samantha Milligan and this is called Don't Cry Over Spilled Milk. He drifted through his apartment, lazily tossing blankets over the edge of the 14-year-old couch and straightened out the placemats on the dining table. Brad meant to leave 10 minutes ago, but he hardly ever retrieved his two daughters from their mother's home on time. It's in his character. At least, he figured that's what was assumed of him at this stage in his relationship with his children. It was his weekend with them, yet he had no plans for the two days ahead. He pictured his eldest daughter, choppy bangs hovering over her eyebrows, and perfectly sized buck teeth peering up at him with her ever-inquisitive eyes, waiting to be told his grand plan for the weekend. They both knew that there was nothing in particular, and even if there was, she wouldn't approve. Not that it mattered much to him, as the weekends were his only days off, children or no children. The night before, his mother called him as usual. She asked her typical stream of questions about his week, what he was eating, when he was planning on visiting next. 
The question he dreaded the most was about his daughters. Do you have the girls this weekend? She almost always emphasized you, knowingly implying that she hated he had shared custody and that his ex-wife couldn't prove to be strict enough with them. Yeah, I'm picking them up around noon tomorrow. That was their routine. Picking the two of them up, watching them extend their goodbyes with their mother and grandmother. He pretended not to notice, even though he was often late, giving them presumably enough time to share their goodbyes. He'd give the two women a flat smile and opened the car door to the back seat, picking up his two young daughters to place them in their respective car seats. Brad would glance in the rearview mirror at his youngest, who rarely smiled at him. Her blonde curls grew frizzier with the windows down, which he knew bothered her. She never met his gaze in the car, only staring out the window. He assumed she had memorized every building. He would stop at the speedway about a half mile from his apartment and hand them cash for a Slurpee from the convenience shop. They had to share, so they both got one flavor of their choice. This particular weekend, he found himself at a loss without any sports games that interested him. He usually counted on there being at least one to fixate on while his daughters attempted to occupy themselves with what little he had to offer them. So, on nights like these, Brad would catch himself searching for a clock so he could keep track of how soon he could force them to get ready for bed. He absentmindedly stirred the spaghetti, knowing full well that was why he always overcooked it. But spaghetti with garlic bread was one of their favorite meals that he made, and his guilt crept in a little stronger this time. After second servings had passed, he grabbed the plate smeared in dried sauce and scatterings of Italian seasoning and headed for the outdated alleyway kitchen. He passed his hands through the kitchen faucet, of which the water pressure was too weak until it nearly turned his hands pink. When he picked up the third plate to scrub, he could just make out frantic whisperings from his daughters in the living room. His youngest tiptoed her way next to him and tugged on his Jeff Gordon t-shirt. Um, Daddy. He set the plate on the drying rack to the right of the sink and looked down at her. He swore she became a younger reflection of his ex-wife. Yes. Sister spilled some milk on the ground. She asked me to get you. Before he realized it, Brad grabbed the roll of the marked down paper towels and stormed into the living room. His eldest daughter was kneeling, attempting to dab up the milk from the freshly installed carpet. Having heeded these warnings before Brad unlocked the apartment door, he couldn't stop himself from palming her right shoulder and pushing her to his left. She emitted a pained yelp, crashing onto her left shoulder, ankles twisting underneath her. His youngest, who had been observing from the kitchen doorway, bolted from her spot to her big sister's aid. Brad felt their stare. The action of shoving his eldest daughter aside was out of character for them. He pressed his palm harshly into the carpet, feeling more of the milk against his skin than on the paper towel. Quiet whimpers came from the other side of the room, but his chest was still expanding rapidly. He felt out of control. It was only milk, practically the same color as the new carpet, and yet he couldn't contain himself. Brad slowly tore his gaze from the imprint of his palm on the dampened paper towel toward his frightened daughters. They were as close to the wall as they could be, hands tightly interwoven as if they were inseparable. They tried to blink away their tears, but he knelt only a few feet away from them, watching as their cries kept resisting the edge of their water lines until sliding down their already dampened cheeks. He rose from his feet, but quickly steadied himself after exerting so much energy into cleaning the milk. Brad never broke eye contact as they flinched when he made a firm step forward, pressing the heel of his foot atop a fresh piece of paper towel. He memorized their wrinkled, tightened eyes, pulled eyebrows and quivering lips. As if he were blinking into the past, he saw their mother, same expression, back pressed against the wall, arms crossed and bracing for impact. He stepped back. So, this is the type of father I've become. The man who is consumed by his anger and frightens his unwanted children. Thank you. Hello. 
My name is Sean Swagger. I'm graduating from the Poetry MFA program, and I will be reading from my thesis titled Hollow Point. Making the most of a global quarantine. Sleep in, wake up, go back to sleep. Learn to make coffee via French press. Conduct all business from bed. PJ's optional. Watch a 17 year old make a website that tracks Corona cases as you fail to write anything for weeks. Catch up on shows. Clothing optional. Let beard grow. Call it quarantine beard, despite having more time than ever to properly trim it. Listen to every Green Day album in chronologic, alphabetic, backward order. Write down favorite lyrics. More coffee. Weigh pros and cons of walking to grocery store. Weigh yourself. Proceed to grocery store. Select favorite wine or beer. Accidentally forget important item. Forget to take bipolar meds. Days bleed together. Exhaust music, shows, games, sleep. The shining city on a hill is a burial mound in Ohio. A serpent mound of bodies tread on by white destiny. A meteor crater medicine manifested in a white streak of sky. A serpent in the sky, shining in the sky. Tread on by white beard, white robes, white gods, white time. Hollow point. There's an echo in the empty halls of Congress. Podiums are unmanned or might as well be until the departure of America's very stable genius, very manly, so manly, no mask is needed. Lest we look like snowflakes, lest our lungs have snowflake shaped x-rays, endless x-rays, boundless damage from codependent liars, codependent authors of this great American carnage, American congressional oversight, overgrown tombstones, grown up questions from grown up kids without parents. Your parents, your Zoom sessions with God. If only he was unmuted, unfazed, on God, on just another breath, so I can hear your voice echo in the halls of Congress, rapturous Congress. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tori Barney. I'm a senior, and this is an excerpt from my short story, The Last Shift. The next, and one of our least, is our other waiter, Eric. Now there's nothing too wrong with Eric. He's a great worker, gets his shit done, but at the same time, everything was wrong with Eric. He's your basic wannabe frat boy. The kind of guy that wears khaki shorts in negative degree winters. The kind of guy that still talks about whatever sport he was semi okay at in high school. It's lacrosse, in case you were wondering. The kind of guy that still feels the need to show off every single one of his Fortnite wins in order to proclaim his masculinity to others. The first time I met the guy was when I caught him stealing tips from one of my tables. I marched right over to him and this is how the conversation went down. Oh hey, you must be that new girl, yeah, Lacey? He licked his thin colorless lips while looking me up and down as if I wasn't just standing there. And you must be the one that steals everyone's tips, yeah, shithead? Only the cute ones. He winks and I feel myself about to vomit. All right, we'll hand them over. I motion with my hands for him to cup up, cough up the couple of dollars. Only if you hang out with me on Saturday. As much as I would love that, I actually have a girlfriend. Oh, well, that's perfect for me, actually. I'll come hang out with you both, then return the money. He shoves the bills deep into his pockets. Right. 
I look around for customers before kneeing him in the stomach. He falls over much faster and much more dramatically than I would have presumed. I bend down next to him and retrieve not only my dollars, but probably some of his as well. That's basically how it went, and not much has changed. Most of our current conversations still include him trying to hang out or him begging me to bring my girlfriend to work sometime. He also tries to steal my tips, so after each table leaves, I have to run back before the little ship beats me to it. But now we're definitely on to the last and most least of them all, my manager, Big Chris. Everyone always wants to know why Big. Sure, it was kind of a weight thing. He looked like the blueberry girl in the Willy Wonka factory, but that wasn't exactly why we called him that. It was probably because he was the man in charge, and while he was supposed to be helping us through the night, he did a big nothing. Before I get into it, before I talk about the countless scenarios and stories about him, I would like you to imagine every single bad boss or manager you have had to deal with. And now I would like you to imagine all those people into one. That, that is who Big Chris is. He's the type of manager to sit in his office watching Netflix, which is bullshit because we're all busting our butts to get everything done and he has the audacity to occupy himself with nothing. At the same time though, he does come out to help, but all it really is is him yelling and complaining to us about stuff we're already working on. He ruins our whole system by bossing around with stuff he's too lazy to do himself. My name is Zoe Hanlon. I'm graduating with a BA in creative writing, concentration in fiction, and this is an excerpt from a novel that I'm currently working on. Working title is I'm Sorry. Despite the heat of the summer blossoming in the early June air, the stones on the front steps were cold under Alicia's bare feet. Her arms were left bare too, t-shirt ending just not long after her shoulders. It was an old one of her dad's, one of the few comforts she had left. Night had long since fallen over the little town yet she still felt the need to keep her arms close, as though the darkness itself had prying eyes. She laid herself down on the front lawn and stared up at the expanse of stars above her. She could feel the moisture from the grass seeping through her sweatpants and thin shirt, but the sensation was dull in her mind. She searched the sky, looking for something she didn't quite know how to find. Look there, little bird. Do you see it? See what, Daddy? Orion. There, see? Those three stars are his belt. And that triangle there is shoulders. I see it. What are those for, Daddy? That's his bow. What does he know to bow for up there? He used it when he lived down here. Then how did he get up there? He was the best hunter in the whole world, but he boasted too much. So a little scorpion stung him and killed him. Gods took pity on him, so they put him up among the stars. And they put the scorpion on the other side of the sky so they wouldn't be able to hurt each other ever again. Oh, where's the scorpion? We can't see him now. I'll show you when the seasons change. Alicia? She shot upright, violently startled to the present by the sound of her own name. Her eyes searched the darkness, looking for a body the voice belonged to, wondering for a fleeting second if it too had been a memory of, like her dad's hand on hers. She bit her lips so hard she tasted blood, trying to hold back the impulse to call for him. It was Jacob Rooney who stood on the sidewalk before her. I'm sorry, he held up his hands as if to prove his innocence. I didn't mean to scare you, just wasn't sure if you were okay. I'm fine, Alicia said a little too quickly. Stars, she pointed up by way of explaining in the vaguest sense. Ah, would you mind if I joined you? No, Alicia said, surprising even herself. She patted the grass beside her. As Jacob sat down, she pulled her arms in across her chest as if she wanted to curl into herself and disappear. Do you know how to find them? Jacob asked. Constellations, I mean. One, Alicia said. Show me. You can't see the stars where I'm from. The stars might be the only thing I like about this little town. Alicia said, eyes on the lights dancing in the sky, not the boy beside her. Show me, Jacob said again. Alicia shook her head. I can't. What do you mean? I can't, Alicia repeated, daring to look at the dim silhouette of his face. I don't understand. They change, Alicia started. Well, they don't change. They move. Not the stars. The earth moves. The stars just look like they move. To us. She sighed in a mix of frustration and embarrassment, before shifting just slightly to better face him. You see different constellations depending on the time of year in which hemisphere you're in. But because of the way the Earth's tilted, I don't really know the science. What we can see is different. Oh, the one I know, the one you can only see it here in like fall and winter. There's sort of two skies, two options, but they rotate slowly across our field of vision, so sometimes you get little hints of both. But it's the middle of the summer right now. 
So unless we both hopped on a plane to Australia or something, I don't have anything I can show you. That's really, I never knew any of that. In all his life, it never occurred to Jacob to look up. The sky in New York was so destroyed with light pollution that it seemed to glow a coppery orange in the darkness, reflecting the light of people back down, dividing them from the world above. It was even more of a cage than he had already believed. Where did you learn all that? My dad, at least he said, looking away from him and back at the stars. He taught me to find Orion, but he never got the chance to show me more. She found herself continuing, even though she didn't think she wanted to. There's a scorpion, Orion's opposite, if you will. We should be able to see him now. My dad, he promised me he'd show me, but he never got to. I'm sorry, Jacob said, not knowing what else to say. What else was there to say? I'm sorry. Alicia opened and closed her mouth but, like she wanted the words to come out, but they didn't. She wished there were words, words to say after I'm sorry. At first, right after it happened, they would always add, for your loss at the end. Then, then she could say thank you. She could say thank you and people would nod and offer a small awkward touch of some kind for her to shy away from. And then they would leave her, leave her to her grief and her feelings as though they had done something right, that they had helped her. And she would forget the interaction in a few days' time, at most. Then, somewhere after the novelty of it all wore off, it became a figment of the past to everyone else. Something that happened so long ago, it couldn't possibly still be a raw, open wound. I'm sorry for your loss, morphed into simply, I'm sorry. She never knew what the right response to that was. Thank you was too formal, too dark, too serious for something said simply because it was what societal norms dictate should be done. In response to I'm sorry, the response she'd always heard, learned, was it's okay. Don't leave the guilt on the other person. Say okay when they apologize. It's okay takes the pain and the guilt off the other person. It makes them think they've done the good thing. A smaller good thing, but a good thing nonetheless. But it's not okay. It would never be okay. Their deaths would never be okay. And she could never bring herself to say it's okay. She could never say those words. So now, like every other time, she simply said nothing at all.